Well, I'm Mary Ann Hansen. Hansen. Introduce herself, but I want to say um, I think it'd be great if you could all give Mary Ann a hand because even I'm, I'm kind of her sidekick in this event. She's done the lion's share of the work pulling this all together, so I think it'd be appropriate to give her a hand. Standing Rock, who's going to open the program with a song for us. Um, Shante is a student here at MSU. He's a music technology major, and he's from the Chippewa Creek people from Rocky Boys. So welcome, Shante. Thank you so much for coming today and sharing with us. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'll just go ahead and uh, do what was requested of me about the best ways that I know how. Um, I will go ahead and sing an honor song. You may sit, you may stand. Um, with my people, with the way that we believe we, we sit down, as in that way we're more connected to earth. But uh, if you if your belief is is that you you should stand, you could go ahead and do so because all ways are good ways. So I'm gonna go ahead and sing an on, honor song on behalf of <coughs> what's going on here. I'll do uh, two verses. Oh. She's also presented on her research at um, an event I run every June, the Tribal College Librarians Institute. So it's been wonderful getting to know Mari and now more of her um, colleague. And so we have uh, Mari Eggers and Ann Camper and uh, John Doyle and um, I'm going to cheat Emery uh, Three Irons and Joe Ray uh, La France. Um, Sarah Young, who I've known for decades, and it's wonderful to see you again, and Christine Martin, an MSU student that I've had the wonderful good fortune to get interact with because I'm a librarian to her liaison area. And um, are you, you two are 
from Bighorn College students or? <laughs> oh, okay, I was thinking there were some on the research team, so um, you guys can tell us all more about yourself. So thank you so much for joining us, and I really look forward to this. Did I miss anybody? Okay. <laughs> Great, thank you. Well, we'll get started. Um, welcome, and we're grateful that so many of you have come to listen to what we have to say, and there's so many things, and I know it's university day, and people could be off and about doing other things, and so we're grateful that people have taken the time to uh, stop by and, and listen to to us talk to you about what we do. And uh, I'm a member of the Crow Tribe. I grew up on the Crow Reservation, and although I worked at Montana State University for 22 years. I retired about a year ago. I also got my graduate degree from here at, at MSU, so it's kind of my, my second home, but my real home is the Crow Reservation. So we're, we're glad to uh, be able to share with you a little bit, and we hope that uh, something we say will be something useful for you. If you're interested in doing research in tribal communities or other diverse communities with indigenous populations, or just with communities that want to have a voice in research related to them. So uh, the Crow Environmental Health Steering Committee um, is a group of individuals on our reservation and our friends that um, started about 13 years ago. And it began as concerns in our community about water and its relationship to our health in our community. And there were people in our community, such as John, and one of our um, real important uh, founding members of our Co-Environmental Health Steering Committee, Myra Lefthand, who isn't here, was going to join us, but um, wasn't able to because family <coughs> um, uh, loss. And so uh, they were colleagues with Mari, and they expressed their concern about, you know, why do we have so much cancer? And at that time, that was one of the concerns. And John was concerned about how the fish were, um, that he was catching in the river had sores on them. And they were just like, what's going on with our water? And Mari was teaching at, at the Little Bighorn College. And so out of that real, community-driven concerns about health and about the water. A group developed the Crow and became eventually the Crow Environmental Health Steering Committee and um, started exploring how uh, we might do research. And, and at that time, I was working for Montana State University and involved with um, a lot of student programs as the Director of American Indian Research Opportunities and working with Montana Embry at that time also. And we were looking for opportunities for our Native American students to be able to do research. But we were doing research, and we had money to pay them to do research in our labs here at Montana State University. But our students wanted to do research about things in our own communities. They wanted the research they were doing to be relevant to them, to their lives, to their families, and to their communities. So it was a, a very good match for me to want to be involved with the Crow Environmental Health Steering Committee. And uh, we've had a, uh, a number of members that have kind of come and go gone, but there's been a group of us that have stayed the whole term. We don't term out like <laughs> politicians because our care for our reservation doesn't, doesn't go away. And so uh, this group has done so many different projects from so many different funding sources, and sometimes just done things without funding sources just because we care about our community, our health, and our water. Um, and um, each one of us have something to speak about, and I'm just kind of the, the introducer. And I, for those of you that don't know anything about the Crow Reservation, we always think everybody knows, because we're a very ethnocentric tribe, and we think that we're the center of the universe. So we think everybody knows about us, but we know there's a few of you that don't. This is a picture of our river that goes right by our campground, kind of separates the campground from our community. And there's a picture of little children swimming. And uh, you know we don't have swimming pools, city swimming pools and what have you. And so our children go swimming in our rivers. And at one time, our families um, gathered water at 
out to our rivers and so on. So um, our reservation is the largest reservation in Montana, land base wise. And we're part of what's called the large land based tribes in the United States. It's certainly not as big as the Navajo Reservation, but it's a very large reservation. It was at one time 32 million square acres before seeding. So it's a, in the south, 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 central, southeastern part of Montana, and we neighbor the Northern Cheyenne Reservation. We have about 14,000. Um, members of our tribe and only about 7,900, probably around 8,000 now of our um, enrolled tribal members actually live on the reservation and then there's some of us that are off reservation like myself now living in Billings, Montana. That was always kind of a, another part of the reservation and so about um, half of us, a little more than half live on the reservation and the others are scattered all over the country, and some may be outside the country. Uh, when our reservation started um, settling, when, when our boundaries were set and we weren't moving about freely, our, our homes and um, encampments and what have you were built along with rivers and streams. And I'm sure much of civilization is built along rivers and streams because we all know that we have to have water. And um, for many years of the reservation, people did not have, and I grew up without indoor plumbing, and I, I remember when we first got water so that we had water in our kitchen sink, and that was a big thing. And then eventually when I was about 13 years old, we got indoor plumbing, and we thought we were really uptown. And it was a big deal. And that started about in the, in the 1960s. And it actually came about because we had gotten money from a settlement, and so our families had money to put in indoor plumbing. Um, let me see, did I go back about too many more? Yeah. Okay, so here's a picture of some of our, our uh, current active members, and of course, John not only is a member of the committee and was one of the founders of the committee, but also um, is one of the project leaders for um, one of the many projects that we've had. And then Myra, left hand, as I mentioned, myself. And I love it that Mari puts one, a picture of me that's about 12 years old, <laughs> old, and I still wish I was quite that young, but not quite. And uh, just Roberta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Roberta. I could, that could be, I think that's one of Roberta when she was younger too. <laughs> and uh, Roberta has a degree uh, in in uh, natural resources, I think, or bachelor's in environmental science and a master's in Native American studies. And, yeah, and she graduated from MSU with her master's. And then Dion um, Pretty on top, who works at Indian Health Service, and also graduated from Montana State University, I believe, in microbiology or one of the and Emory Three Arts, who's here with us, um, was working on his master's and also um, <coughs> is a UDAL, or was a UDAL fellow, and adds a lot to our committee and our work. And Gail Whiteman, who also graduated from here at Montana State University. Christine Martin, who finished a, bas a bachelor's here and then a master's in, in community health. And of course, Mari, who works here at MSU, and Ann Camper, who's a long, long time faculty here at, at MSU. So you can see the, the, um, the relationship this committee has to Montana State University. Some people might say we're biased. <laughs> we aren't. We aren't. It's just that's where good people come from. So anyway, our, our committee, um, a, a lot of times when people are doing community-based participatory research, one of the things they always establish is a community advisory board, a CAB. And a CAB can mean a lot of things. And I said, I really wanted to start out by talking about Crow Environmental Health Steering Committee, which is really much more than a CAB. Uh, a lot of times people want to do CBPR and they say, well, we're going to have community input. And they meet with them twice a year, have lunch and about an hour of meeting. 
and it involves the researcher telling the community advisory board what they're doing and the community advisory board saying that's good and that is not what the community environmental health steering committee is at all we meet about three hours at least once a month sometimes more we email back and forth with one another on a very regular basis and we have conference calls it's a wonder we have jobs outside of community health or uh, pro-environmental health. In fact, maybe it's why I'm retired, because my kids always say, are they paying you? And I'm like, no, 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 this is passion. And uh, that's really what I wanted to say to people, is when you have a group that you're going to work with in a community, and it's about research that affects that community, it's so important to have people that have passion about what your project is about, and that that project reflect what that community wants to have studied. Because if it's something that's only the researcher's passion and the community doesn't have a stake in it, when your project is over, it's some publications and some grant money that's been spent, but it's done. And we hope that our project will have uh, many generations of impact on our community that we will have found ways to make our water healthier to make our communities know the importance of having safe drinking water and what ties if any this water and the damage to the water might have on our health so it's it's really about a lot of that and i think that's what's the great success of this project is having that kind of involvement so those of you that are in the research business think about that when you're going to go into a community and find those people and have the community help you find people that really have an interest in that topic. And so that's kind of what, what, uh, what it is. And so what do we do when we talk and all of this? And these are just some <coughs> pictures. This was one of us um, out in front of our little Bighorn College and Emory when he was gathering water samples and John when he was talking to a program that um, we're affiliated with and are part of their advisory board, the Guardians of the Living Water that Vanessa Watt Simons here on campus is doing. She's a faculty member here. And John is talking to some of her fourth and fifth graders about water quality and sampling and the importance of um, healthy water and so on. And then down below, I'm actually, as a steering committee member, helping them gather data and writing down the information as Mari and the others are calling out data to me and I'm trying to keep up with them and writing stuff down and we were over on a field trip to Pryor. And the last one over in the other corner is two of the other distinguished committee members who aren't uh, living at home anymore. Uh, John, of course, and Urban Bear Don't Walk, who was a uh, tribal member who's a lawyer, was a lawyer for our tribe. And then Larry Kynas, who was a very, um, an activist on our reservation. And I think he made John become an activist, or <laughs> vice versa. And they were partners in crime. And they were at the National Congress of American Indians talking about the research that we're doing. Um, we've also been involved in actually helping write the journal articles. And by that, if Mari you know, remembers when she first, I said we should do that. And she said, how would we do that? How would we all write it together? And I said, I'll figure it out. And we started meeting on weekends and going to a hotel and meeting for half a day on Friday and all day Saturday, going over every sentence, every paragraph, and saying, no, we don't want our community to hear the words like that. They'll be mad at us. And let's say it differently. Let's say it in a way that when we're home and somebody has read it, they don't say, why did you say that? And so that was really an exercise in love, I guess you might say. <laughs> uh, but we actually, and that article got, that got published. And I can't remember what journal it was in, sorry. Family and Community Health. Family and Community Health. But that's another activity that you really want to involve the community in, is publishing and stay, telling your story about your research in such a way that when the community reads it, they find it acceptable as well. So that's really what I wanted to share with you about our um, steering committee and how it differs from a cab. <coughs> and um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Christine and um, Jory. 
<laughs> so I'm Christine Martin. Um, I work closely with John Doyle and Maureen Eggers and the other steering committee, committee members. I'm alumni from Montana State University. <coughs> I work closely with Vanessa Simons. She was my mentor, as well as um, Suzanne Christopher, and so and many other faculty members here. And so I work at the Little Bit Crime College right now. And my title is the um, Crow Climate Adaptation Program Coordinator. And so I'm the one that coordinates the meetings and we send emails back and forth with each other and just keep us in contact and meeting and organized, I guess you could say. And um, so my background is mostly in qualitative study and research design. And so with that, I'm able to interview people and. Um, get those interviews, transcribe them, um, analyze them, and then produce themes out of them. And then with that, we can kind of get a better understanding of what people are thinking in the community and stuff like that. And then, so I work closely with Jory LaFrance, who is a recent graduate. And so she's interning with our um, water quality program at the Little Bitcoin College. So I'll let her tell a little bit about her stuff. Yeah, so hi everyone. My name is Jory LaFrance. I am a Crow Tribal member. I am in my post-bac year, so taking my gap year between undergraduate and graduate school. I graduated from Dartmouth College with a double major in Earth Sciences and Native American Studies, and am going to start graduate school in the fall. I haven't decided yet, but I do have options. Um, and like Christine was saying, I have been interning with the Crow Environmental Health Steering Committee since June, last June, and we've just been working on this uh, climate adaptation plan and so I guess we can go back move to forward. Okay, so we just wanted to um, get a better, better understanding of how people um, understood climate change and then what they noticed throughout their lifetime with the weather patterns. And so we gathered information from Crow tribal members and um, their knowledge of climate change and ecolo ec ecological knowledge changes. And then we gathered Western science data on historical and pro projected climate changes. And then we just wanted to understand how these knowledge sources complemented each other, as well as how these um, how they uh, complemented each other and then addressed the environmental health issues that were um, in our community. And so we hear a lot about what is TEK, so traditional ecological knowledge. Um, we feel like we can't really define, but we can define what it means to us. So um, in a nutshell, I guess, um, we feel our belief that there is energy and power and that we all are a part of that energy and that we are born into this way of knowing as well as we all have spiritual growth. And we got all of this through oral history from our elders and our family members. And so our method was to take um, TEK, which how we did that was used the qualitative research design, and we used in-depth interviews, um, and then we did the content analysis with our steering committee members, as well as, um, oh, and then from that we collected themes, and so I'll introduce a couple of those, but um, we're mostly gonna go over the questions that we asked and what came out of those, and then we compared that to Western data. And then so Jory can kind of explain more what Western data is. Yeah, so the Western <coughs> aspect of this is um, we're getting a lot of this climate data from, you know, history and this historical database as well as using that historical data to project what's going to happen in the future based on certain um, circumstances. And so the importance of comparing both of these is we're trying to, one, we live in a world that bases everything on Western science, and so we're trying to use these as a way of complementing each other, and I guess TEK is a more or less new theme in Western science, but indigenous knowledge has always been with us since time immemorial, and so the importance of comparing these two just goes to show the validity of TEK, and that <coughs> our knowledge is very valid and it has been existing, and so that's the reason why we're comparing these two. So with the interviews, we um, interviewed 26 tribal members, 
and we asked them um, questions about climate change throughout their lifetime. Um, and then from that, we got together and we did a content analysis. And um, me and Jory transcribed the interviews. And then we all got together and um, pulled things out of them. And then so going over the questions, we asked the um, participant if they noticed um, a change in winter snowfall throughout their lifetime. And a majority of them did. And so a lot of them noticed that there were higher drifts, more snowfall, um, compared to the last 20 years where it has, they don't remember any snow drifts at all, or any snow sticking through the winter months. And so this um, quote just demonstrates how, like in the 70s, they noticed very high drifts, and then nowadays that they don't see those drifts that high, and that um, that they used to be are used to be up to like three to six inches compared to now where it's only six inches. So going from that, we can see the um, a graph that we had generated from the national climate data, and you can obviously obviously see that there's a decline in snowfall, and that is shown by data that has been collected um, for more than 100 years now. And so that just is one example, and we'll go forward. Okay, so again, we asked participants if they notice a change in winter temperature throughout their lifetime, and a lot of them have. Um, so going from like the 50s, 60s on up, and then comparing that to the last 20 years. So they notice that there is um, milder temperatures through the winter months, and that the, um, it, the the snowfall doesn't last as long, and that there's no big storms, so there's less snowfall and mild temperatures. Um, we asked participants if they noticed a change in the spring break, spring ice breakup, and they noticed that they have. To compare from when they were younger, that um, they remember people going to the river and using dynamite to break up the ice, and that it was, um, a cultural thing and that they did it every year and that compared to the last 20 years that they don't remember us doing that or that if the um, river even freezes over. We asked participants if um, they noticed a change in the winter weather patterns and they have. So they noticed that um, the winters come, they remember it used to come after Halloween and from there all the way up into March there would be um, snow. So compared to the last 20 years, they noticed that there isn't any snowfall all the way up into almost December sometimes, and then that it doesn't last well into um, March, that it's early February before it's <coughs> starting to get warm. So over the years, we have seen an increase in average annual temperatures, and that's important when we're talking about you know, when the snow falls, when it melts, when we have spring runoff, um, you know, when we have super hot summer temperatures. So everything is all related and everything is all connected. So when one thing is, you know, out of like its normal temperature or what you would normally see, it's going to affect something down the line and that's going to affect something, that's going to affect something. So it's all connected and that's the way that we're looking at this. And so with the winter temperatures, the weather patterns being all mixed up, um, we've seen an increase in the average annual temperature. And keep in mind that these are um, historical data and some of these will have projections under uh, certain circumstances. So that's one thing to consider. Um, participants were asked if they noticed longer summer, when summer heat temperatures or if they were longer summers throughout their lifetime. And they noticed that um, there is a change in how the season pattern goes along. So it used to be to where um, it would start in June, and then by August or early September, it would start <coughs> changing. But they noticed that it begins really kind of in March or April, and then lasts into October. So they noticed that there is hotter summers, and that there is um, temperatures above 90 degrees, almost into the 100 degrees weather more often nowadays. So we can see the data here that shows that and supports the argument that we have increasing temperatures. And you know, Mount Montana, as you all know, we have very distinct um, seasons. And so we know, you know, what to expect. But 
we're starting to see more and more days of 90 degree weather, which is unusual for us. You know, we're used to you know a couple days here and there, but we're seeing we're starting to see that increase, which you know affects you know droughts or precipitation and um, so on and so forth. And so these hotter weather temperatures are also keeping people inside more, and so that's um, kind of affecting how they see patterns and seasons changing, our indicators of um, season changing, or like the um, decrease or increase of plants or animals. So we noticed in the um, younger de generation that they um, didn't really see a change, or they didn't really understand the questions. Yeah, this is just uh, adding on to that. Um, our summers are getting hotter. Uh, some of them talked about our summers being longer. Uh, one of the examples they talked about was um, being out at Crow Fair and having to go into your car and turn your AC on or having to go home and turn your AC on because it's so hot and that's not what they're used to. And so this is just uh, going and showing us and supporting the <laughs> argument that we are obviously getting hotter summers over time. This one as well. Yep, and this one's actually uh, the historical one projected that I was talking about. And so you have, uh, you can see on there, yeah, there's the lower emissions in blue, uh, meaning that if we're under, so if you're under a certain threshold uh, as far as like CO2 emissions, you're going to get that blue projection and it's still increasing from where we are now. Whereas you have higher emissions in red and that's at an obviously higher increase um, and an incline than the blue. And so you can see, you know, they're comparing the lower emissions and higher emissions of where we can go in the future. Um, and so this is just showing that we're having that increased annual temperature. Um, we asked participants if they see less rainfall or if they notice a difference in rainfall throughout their lifetime. And most participants have. So they were talking about how um, the seasons used to be more on and that the rain would come at a time and then during the summer months it would come off and on and that when the thunder came in the spring that's when they knew um, it arrived and it was always kind of around the same time and then compared to the last 20 years they noticed that um, they haven't seen much rain and that during the summer months um, there's maybe one or two days where it rains and then they don't see any rain after that and so I think that makes it for um, the hotter temperature as well and um, they feel like it's impacting their berry picking, impacting wildlife, um, impacting their rivers, or the um, amount of water in their rivers. And so the next slide will kind of demonstrate the Western science. Yeah, so this is a lot of information. Um, so I guess overall, um, what these uh, graphs are trying to show us is that we are having a decline in our annual precipitation. and. According to the Montana Climate Assessment, um, we are decreasing our annual precipitation by an inch a year. Um, and so that might not seem like a lot, but Montana is actually in a drought. <laughs> and especially Eastern Montana and going in, into our reservation, uh, we are in a drought, so we have to be very cognizant of how much water we use and how much precipitation we're getting. And so this decline in precipitation is going to affect us in the future and that's one thing that we're trying to you know address and also figure out um, we asked participants about the flood of 78 the flood of 2007 and the flood of 2011 and we asked them um, what they what kind of impacts it had on their lifestyle as well as their health and if they felt like that um, impacted the community as well as if they felt like it was more severe than what they remember from the past. And most participants um, believe that the flood kind of changed their lifestyles, and they some talked about how um, that a lot of houses were <coughs> along the river and they got damaged, and once the waters receded, they still had to go and back, move back into their houses. So they felt like that might have had an impact on their health, as well as how the flood might have changed the rivers along their houses, to where maybe the river don't flow by their house anymore. So they felt like they were they were more severe from the past or more frequent. When we're looking at a river from a holistic perspective, 
Um, rivers go through cycles, so they have flood cycles. And we saw that in 2007 and 2011, we had these huge floods that devastated our community. And so the importance of getting this information, getting this data, and predicting future floods is important for us so we can prepare for these kinds of events. Um, so our, I mean, obviously it's going to happen, rivers flood. <laughs> Um, so we need to be pre better prepared as a community and for us to know this kind of information is important when we're talking and conversing with our community and trying to prepare for things like this. And so actually the 2007 and 2011 were huge spikes of um, water influx and basically uh, destroyed lodgegrass and crow agency in 2011. So. Um, we asked um, participants about wildfires and if they notice a difference uh, about of the amount of wildfires that they see and so most participants talked about how they didn't really see wildfires or if they went to wildfires they were like either out of state or not in the area and that it wasn't as common compared to um, now where they've seen more fires in the Crow Agency area and around the ridges that they can remember frequent fires or um, recall um, numerous fires that they have seen throughout the years. And so we just thought that was important because um, it's showing like the drought or maybe we could better link it to <coughs> help them understand what's going on with the water. So this is a map of the uh, drought in Montana. This actually was, yeah, taken in, um, pulled from the website on September 26th and so clearly you can see that the majority of Montana is in a drought and that's important for us to know when we're talking about our water resources as a tribe in our community um, personally how much water we use and it also affects fires um, like Christine was talking about we've seen an increase in fire fires as far as how many we've had and how long they last and how bad they are and so this map it kind of shows, you know, how dry our land may be or how much water we're missing here in the puzzle. Um, so we asked uh, participants if they seen a loss in um, animals, uh, bird species um, was one that came up a lot. And so we asked them if they um, seen a loss in prairie chickens or the sage grouse, and which a majority of them have. Um, a lot of them haven't seen the sage grouse in quite a while compared to previous years. Um, we, they talked about them being on the endangered list. Um, some people talked about <coughs> birds that they had seen when they were younger compared to now where those birds haven't been seen or heard from. Um, they've also distinct the birds by um, listening to their call and how they notice that there's less calls or um, just different calls or calls that they haven't heard in a long time. Um, we asked them about plants, and they talked about um, how they thought there was a loss of plants. Um, the mint that they collect, or the berries that they collect, um, cattails, they noticed that they were smaller, or they were harder to find. Um, cottonwood trees, they noticed that they were smaller, or that they haven't seen any new growth. And they again maybe thought that was from the drought or that notice that the river hasn't, isn't full enough to um, plant those cottonwood trees. Um, they noticed a lot of amphibians, and so when we asked them this question, um, they talked mostly about not um, hearing frogs or seeing frogs compared to when they were children. They talked about not seeing um, insects, less insects, less bees, an increase in mosquitoes and spiders, but then they also talked about how some years um, there was a spike in some animals or some insects compared to other years. They kind of changed throughout the summer months. We asked them if they noticed a loss in the berries or um, culturally important plants, and the berries came up a lot. They felt like they were um, hard to find. Maybe they weren't there because um, less rainfall, or they were competing with the animals as well as other families are um, people picking the berries. And then they thought maybe they haven't seen the berries along the side of the road um, as, more, as commonly as they used to. And they kind of put that against um, agriculture. 
and that them spraying for them and stuff, and maybe that's why they're not growing. And so one of the, a big theme that came out of the interviews was loss. So we felt like there was a loss in ceremonial practices, um, just like the plants and animals decreasing. Um, they, the participants contributed that to like the newer age being inside more, um, the increase in technology uses, maybe the increase in temperatures, um, keeping people inside. So um, we feel like it was just, there was a decrease in how the ceremonial practices is used. And so um, again, we were gonna talk about how, what we pulled out of this. So we feel like the TEK provides qualitative observations. Um, and from this, we've seen that there was a loss or a decline in spring ice breakup. Um, Midwinter thaws are the, impacting the timing of the plants or trees how, when they bud. Um, a reduction in grass or the cattail height a loss in frogs or amphibians, um, insects, animals, and then compared to the Western knowledge we got from that, what we got from that. Yeah, yeah, so um, obviously you've seen throughout the presentation that the majority of the Western science and TEK coincided, so they supported one another. And that's what we would like to see, um, but there are going to be some differences. And one of the excuse me, one of the biggest differences that we saw was the length of knowledge and data that we have. So as far as Western science, I mean, you wouldn't have someone collecting these samples like 200 years ago or something like that. And so we're able to get this data um, only to a certain extent. Whereas our traditional ecological knowledge, our indigenous knowledge has been passed down through generations and generations. So this knowledge has been with us for as long as we can remember. And that's one of the biggest differences that we need to understand, but they also do coincide with one another. And this is just one of the projections that I was talking about. Um, we are going to see, I mean, this is just kind of a, a uh, conclusion to the data that we were talking about and we're going to have increasing summer temperatures, decreasing precipitation, and our drought is going to get worse if we don't act and do something about it now and obviously that's easier said than done. Um, so yeah. Um, this one and then um, just to sum it up that <coughs> so there was a Montana climate assessment and the Shaded area blue are the where they assessed, and so our area is like the number five where it's not really shaded. But when we did our assessment, it just complemented the Montana climate assessment and um, coincided with what they said about those regions. And so, just in conclusion, um, the crows have always lived in Montana, and so we are experiencing more climate change, and so. Well, basically, um, we respect water, and water is very important to us, and so we use the water and the river for a lot of cultural practices, and so from that, we are, um, from the climate change, we are put at risk, or higher risk, and it's kind of going to be hard for us to adapt to those changes, or maybe fix what they're impacting on our lifestyle, or how. So that was a question. For me that she's kind of switched up my slides I had a different picture I wanted to show but this is a picture of the Living Orange River and actually I am currently a grad student here at MSU in the Land Resources and Environmental Science Department. My advisor is Scott Powell and I am getting close to being done. <laughs> I am getting close to the analysis phase actually running my analysis but I'm still organizing my data and that's kind of where I'm at and with my research I want to share with you I want to impact like four groups with my research and one is like people outside the reservation you know they might be able to help us later 
when they hear about this, our water quality problems. And two is our younger generation. And actually, this is my son, Avery. And I asked him to come with me because he actually lives in Billings with his mom. And he's on a spring break. And he didn't want to come, but uh, you know, I wanted him to come because he once told me that he wanted to get a PhD. He's always trying to one-up for me, you know. <laughs> always trying to, we're competing. And our younger generation, when, if they start thinking that way, we're moving down a good road. And like I said, that is another group that I would like to have impact on with this project is our younger generation on a reservation. I would like them to start pursuing STEM, STEM fields. You know, we need a lot of scientists and, and math students and engineering, especially engineering. And I hope, you know, myself and Christine and Joy were kind of the younger generation, Sarah, John, and Mari, and they're older generation and John always tells me you know, we're, you guys are next in line, you guys are going to be taking over and I'm always just like messing around but I'm like yeah it's John, you're always going to be there but you know I know he's right it's going to be going to be our turn and hopefully my son and another group like I said I would like them to know about this is our tribal leaders. That's because they, you know, they're in charge of money. And we get funding from various sources. And, you know, this is a problem. And there's no easy fix, though. This is, this is a difficult fix. And because I know that because I've been out with John, we did a lot of field work this past summer. And, the tribal members always ask us, you know, what are you, what are you guys going to do? How are you guys going to fix it? And we're like, we don't know. And it's always like a million dollar question is like, how are we going to do this? How are we going to fix this? And so I hope this research is able to impact them and they're able to make sound decisions, you know, using this information. And, and the last one is like just letting our tribal members know of this research because they, I feel like they have a right to know what's going on with nature, how it's changing, how it's impacting their health and their homes, and they have a right to know. And so this is my, this is my, um, my research, you know, I'm investigating coliform and home wells, and I'll get to it later, but we actually did a lot of my field work in June, May and June. We collect like 100 samples and and I have some of the res results in there. And first of all, you know, what is coliform? You know, it's a bacteria and it comes from, you know, animal feces or human feces. And if you ingest it, you know, you, there's some acute illnesses like diarrhea, you know, no one likes diarrhea, you know, have upset stomach and the long term is still, is still not too much, not too much known yet, and it's still looking at research now. But the acute stuff, you know, there's a lot of stomach aches, and there's a lot of people that still drink their well water. When in the spring, when I first started working there, me and John would go out, and there was this family. A family of three, you know, mother, father was there, and a child. And the mother and the child were drinking, while well, they were all drinking, but the mother and the child were getting sick. They would always get the right diarrhea. And the father, he must have had a stronger immune system. He wasn't getting sick, but those two were. And they qualified to get a water cooler, so we gave them a water cooler. And that's just a, you know, a quick fix. You know, those water gallons, those dispensers, those five gallon dispensers. 
we gave them that, and then a lot of people appreciate those, and that's just a quick fix. And this tray is actually a photo of a uh, coliform when it's all positive, and that one was a uh, total, total positive, every square. And my area of interest for this uh, study is along the Little Bighorn River, which is highlighted. And we collected 100 samples in this valley in May and June with the help of Christine, John, and Joy, and a couple interns from Little Bighorn College. And like I said, this is one of, one of the coolers that we give out, and the picture is actually of a well, home well. And the goal of this research is, you know, I want to examine relationships between coliform contamination and some physical characteristics I have listed, and you will see in a few minutes, and some well storage chip factors. And I hope this, like I said earlier, I hope this guy is able to guide our tribal leaders to make sound decisions for our home, people with home wells. But like I said, there's no easy, easy fix to this problem. And this is my well store, well store ship factors. A lot of this I collected on site. All of this I actually collected on site and we predicted that you know, well caps, so as long as you have a well cap, you'll reduce polyform contamination. And my other one was, if there's livestock on the property, I thought there will be higher coliform contamination. But I have a diagram later, I'll show you, that kind of wasn't the case, which was surprising. And this is the physical characteristics, and actually, this is where I'm at with my data, is I'm still trying to figure out the production formation and the aquifer type, and I still got to derive the land cover type and the distance to river, and that's kind of where I'm at, and I'm using you know, ArcMap software, and that's what, hopefully when I finish that, I can you know, run my analysis. And like I said, this is what we did the field work in May and June. And if you look at this picture, this was like half, like 50. And you can see some of the ones that are positive, you know, they're dark yellow. And when, when me and John seen that, you know, we're like, dang it. There's a lot of people that need help, you know, with that. And there's just no quick fix. And these, the rest of these pictures, you know, these, these are two interns along with Christine helping. And we, they, the interns actually helped a lot because we would get like five samples a day, every day in March and June, or May and June, get like five samples a day. And it was just like clockwork after a while. It was just everybody get off and they know what to do. Get samples, write stuff down. and. It's quick, I think the quickest we were back in Crow by was like 10 o'clock. You know, John's always eager to, he's always rushing around, he's like, let's go, we gotta go. We head out by like 7.30 in the morning sometimes, you know. But, um, but he was good, he kept us, on, uh, kept us on our toes. And this is the result of the home wells. The red is coliform and the green is non-coliform. And like you can see, there's kind of like a pattern here. There's some clusters here, here, and here. And this is like in the wild area. Lodge grass, Reno Creek, close to Reno Creek, Benteen, and Black Lodge area. And hopefully, when I do run an analysis that paints a better picture why is, why is it clustered like that? And to me, right now, just taking a quick guess, assumption is like the geology plays a big part, I believe, 
to me it seems like and this is just showing what what was on the map like there was uh, 30 33 present and 67 absent of college form and like I said earlier what was surprising was, you know, I thought with livestock present on a property, there will be more contamination. But this wasn't the case. This is higher with no, when there was no livestock. So there's some other factors at play there, and hopefully the analysis is able to paint a better picture. And this is just some of my acknowledgments, some of my funding. My, you know, my lab mates here on campus. Any mm -hmm. questions? Are we taking questions? At the end. At the end. Oh, at the end? Okay. Thank you. And Emory didn't say in introducing himself, he is both a, a Sloan scholar, graduate student here, and he also has Montana's first ever graduate minority graduate fellowship from National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences from an NIH. Um, and the last time I talked to the program officer, she says that NIHS currently has four such fellows across the country, and Emory's one of them. So anyway, we're very proud of his, his work. <laughs> So we've been working on a lot of different aspects of water quality. You've heard everything from climate change to microbial contamination to some of the projects Sarah just briefly referred to, um, including educational projects with kids. This was kind of our initial assessment at looking at all the different potential sources of contamination and how people could be exposed to those contaminants, some through river water, some through well water, some through traditional uses of springs including quite a few people who are getting home drinking water from springs. And all the squares there that are colored in are aspects that we have been working on. And in addition to this, looking at how climate change is changing these pictures. So the next section, I'm just going to talk about our home well water testing program, because this seemed to be the most direct, um, serious exposure to contaminants to families. And according to USGS data, about half of the county, about half of all families rely on home wells. So this is our home well water testing program. You've heard a lot about just the outreach with families that Emory and John and Christine and our students, including Jory, last summer have been doing. But in addition to just testing home wells, we make sure those results get back to families and explain to them what it's about and, and the what we've been able to do really in the last year is to provide home water coolers if their well water is unsafe. And the reason for this strategy is, yes, if you've got really hard water and it's high in iron and it's high in total dissolved solids and there's some arsenic in there, you can put in a water softener and you can put in an iron and manganese removal unit and then you can put in a reverse osmosis unit and then you can replace the chemicals on all three of those, you know, every month. And by the time you've paid for all that, but you can't afford to do it. Um, I, I, I learned this when I, I married a tribal member and followed him back to the reservation and moved in what had been his grandparents' house and the water was so bad that really all we could do was flush the toilet with it. Um, he felt like he'd been in salt water after showering in it and he tried to use it, I tried to wash dishes with it and stain my hands black from the manganese. And, well, it takes a while to understand all the ways that that bad water affects you. But most families, even if they were willing to deal with all that hassle, that's just too expensive. So we found that these five gallon water coolers, like you often find in office buildings, have been the, an economical and effective solution. And it's, you know, it's a short term solution. It's not perfect, but it's the best we've been able to come up with so far. So just briefly, each of these contaminants we've mapped this is a spatial picture, looks like, and it turns out the four most common Serious contaminants are manganese, uranium, arsenic, and nitrate. 
of these four manganese is the only one that will discolor the water and give it a funny taste. It'll taste kind of metallic, like iron. And you may think you just have an iron problem. Of course, we all know we need iron, so you don't worry too much about that. And unless you really learn about well water in Montana, you don't realize that what you think could be iron is probably a mixture of iron and manganese. And the manganese, in fact, is a neurotoxin, causes nerve damage and brain damage. It's especially serious for infants and children. But even in adults, it can cause something that um, gives you Parkinson's-like sy symptoms. So it's quite a serious contaminant. And you can see from this that especially the lower part of the Little Bighorn River, so that's up on the map, because these rivers flow north. And the lower part of the Bighorn River as well has manganese contamination issues. And here's where nitrate's an issue. And this corresponds mostly with where there is irrigated agriculture. So it doesn't seem to be coming from people's home septic systems. It seems to be coming from fertilizer from agriculture. And here is a uh, map for uranium. And again, you can see it's the Bighorn River, that middle valley where we have the ur ur worst uranium problems. And traditionally in Montana, home wells were never tested for uranium. So if you took your water sample you know, to some lab in Billings and said, I want a complete domestic analysis, they'd run a whole lot of things, but they wouldn't run uranium. And it wasn't until Anita Mornall, who was actually a Crow Tribal member, and she was doing her, starting her doctoral research here, said, you know, I think you guys ought to be testing for uranium. We said, OK, well, we'll try. We'll add it to the list. And we discovered this really is a serious contamination issue on the reservation. and. Um, and especially in the Bighorn River Valley. And you can see here in the lower corner of the map, those are old uranium vanadium mines. And those are all in the headwaters of the Bighorn River Valley here. So some combination of just naturally occurring erosion and gravels could be exacerbated from mining. We're not sure which. But um, we're not surprised by the geology that this is where it's showing up. So in summary, it's, sorry. The, the summary here is about a quarter of all home wells are unsafe due to one of these four minerals. And the worst well water you can see in the Bighorn River Valley, 64%, almost two thirds are unsafe just based on these four. And area around Co Agency and Myola, about a quarter of all home wells. And there's an area around Lodgegrass and in Pryor that have better water quality. So now, there really there are two ways of assessing health risk from home well water. And we just started out looking at how does the water quality compare to what the EPA standard is for municipal water. And doing an, an additive way of looking at the risk from those four common contaminants, we come up with about 24%, about a quarter of all home wells rank unsafe that way. There's another more complicated way of assessing risk where you actually look at factor in how much people are drinking on average per day throughout the year for how many years and um, whether they're a 50 pound child or a 200 pound adult. If you calculate that way, the EPA has different standards, oddly enough, and you don't get quite the same answers. If you look at it that way, almost 40% of home wells are unsafe. Um, so it, it matters how you calculate that risk. And this is just putting the picture together. Here's where wells are unsafe. Again, you can see Bighorn River throughout the middle. Really bad water quality. Everything that is red and dark red there is over the EPA standards. And the ones that are orange uh, can calculate unsafe if you consider consumption. One more note on water quality. This is just a map of total dissolved solids. So that's sort of a general measure of overall water quality. Anything there that is in yellow, orange, red, or dark red is over the standard by for town water, for, for EPA, for <coughs> municipal water. So you can see more than 90% of wells on the reservation wouldn't be considered of good enough quality to be municipal water. And this is not just a, a taste issue, but it also means that along with high dissolved solids, with high sulfate, Lots of wells have high iron, high hardness. This makes it really difficult and expensive to treat the water to drinking water standard. 
if all we had was, say, an arsenic issue and not these other ones, we might just be able to install an arsenic filter. But this combination makes it very expensive. Um, and it also deteriorates your plumbing really quickly. We discovered that our water was so hard and cruel that after a year and a half, it destroyed our hot water heater. And while we replaced it once, not really realizing what was going on, another you know, 12 months went by and that one went out, we finally realized that our, our well water was just not going to work with our hot water heater. It's just a little bit about communicating results to families. So they, they get a, a letter that sort of highlights the main things that are issues and what they can and can't safely do with their well water. And they get a spreadsheet like this that explains the lab test results. Everything in yellow are things that are going to be hassle in terms of their plumbing. And the things that are red are things that are, are health risks. This is one of the, the worst well. I, I did pick an example that's worse than average well water, but a lot of wells look like this. And actually, where we lived, that could be our report from where we lived in Crow. And the middle photo shows uh, a demonstration of how you shock chlorinate a well. This is a way of disinfecting it with just a combination of um, diluted household bleach and pour it down your wellhead and run it through your plumbing system. And we actually made a, a short video that demonstrates this and explains it both in Kroll and in English. And that's on our Facebook page in the community. And so we'll also explain this to people. And on the far right is just a picture of one of the water coolers we've been able to hand out. And this is what we're working on right now, is looking at what is the seasonal difference and are wells worse in the spring when there's high water and a lot of runoff? Or are they worse in late summer when water levels are lower? And um, that's, that's the question we're trying to answer right now. And with that, I'm going to let John continue. And John is both our PI for Little Bighorn College and our uh, program leader for our research. And he has been working on water issues in Crow for a lifetime. So I want to talk a little bit about partnerships. But before I do, uh, the photo, first so photo you see there is kind of um, the reason I really became involved in this whole uh, this whole issue that we're dealing with and have been dealing with is that um, 35 years ago, I was questioning why there's raw sewage running into the Little Bighorn River in such volume that there's steam rising out of that flowing water in the middle of winter, and why it wasn't frozen, and going and looking for an answer and not finding any answer or a solution. And I was expecting uh, an immediate solution, and uh, that shows you how little I actually knew. That, and I didn't know where to go to find solutions or answers. And so for me to be here with everybody today, you, don't, you can't imagine how good it makes me feel. You know, Christine, Jory, and Emery, I mean, that is our future. And I've told that to Emery many times. And you know, it's been a pleasure to work with Ann and Maury and Sarah and the rest of the board members because uh, we've taken steps to change uh, long forgotten and unsolved solutions. And like Emory pointed out, they are not quick solutions. So 1981 is my start date. The steering committee started in 2005. And so for that period of time between 81 and 2005, there was very little that we could do. We tried, but uh, so partnerships made everything. It made the difference. And so the steering committee has been just invaluable for us to uh, make small steps. And what those pictures represent is uh, a complete change of infrastructure in the town of Regency, in the original part of town. All sewer lines, all water lines, the wastewater lagoon all changed out. But because in the early days we didn't have a supporting group that uh, helped guide our way, we didn't have the research where we can turn to and ask for research that helped. But we do now. At one point, we was even challenged on how valid our questions were. And I couldn't validate it because I didn't have that background of uh, researchers. But we do now. If that same question is asked. I, f I know a source that I can find the answer to that. But what Emory didn't point out uh, is um, one of the biggest partners that we have is um, our tribal community and really establishing our trust in us as a functioning group of people that want to make a difference. 
in 2017, we went out and tested 100 wells. In 2016, Emory and myself traveled 14,000 miles that summer, starting in March and finishing in July. In the most remote locations that you possibly could imagine, we were there. We were there because that's a source of water for our tribal members when they're hunting, when they're gathering berries or just camping. All of those, like, you, like Christine and Jory pointed out, those are our food sources and they're important to us yet. And so we wanted to know the water quality in those areas. And so when a tribal member asked us how uh, the spring was up on top of the mountains, let's say that crystal caves, we can tell them what that water looked like. Or on top of the priors, we can tell them what that water looked like. That was our way to build trust in our community. We're not here and then we're gonna be gone. We live here, we drink that same water as them. So that photo that you're seeing there is a photo of uh, the spring in Aplenicus. That's our chief's, the old chief's house in the background. And in the front, you see the, the spring. And the question there was, why do we have contamination in that spring? And uh, so for the past five years, we worked with uh, Stephanie Ewing and a number of her associates and looking for an answer there. Uh, we don't have a final answer, but we have a pretty good idea. And so um, when I talk about partnerships, um, that is one of them. Um, this next photo here is um, this one. That, uh, this is a kind of a new one that we're doing, and Jory was working with uh, Stephanie Ewing and looking at uranium in the wells that we found. In, um, we collected samples on the Big Horn River in 2016. And so that's just kind of at the beginning stage. I think Jory worked on it a little bit today. But every one of these photos and slides that I'm showing you are partnerships that we didn't have before. And because we didn't have them, we didn't have answers or we didn't have direction on how to resolve issues. And so we do have that now. Uh, you know, I can't say that enough. But this is another photo here. This is one of our uh, graduate students, Kina. <coughs> And uh, he's, he works out of Bozeman. He also goes out and collects samples. The photo that you see down below there is a photo of Keenan showing some of um, Little Bighorn students uh, his procedure on testing. And so um, the next photo is a, a new research project that we're actually starting with Steve Hamner. And uh, that is also looking at and trying to understand why we have a new kind of a contaminant in Little Bighorn River that we're just at the beginning stages of that. And uh, the reason we show that picture with those kids in the river so often is because, uh, like it's been pointed out, we don't have another source that we can go to for recreation. In the summertime when the extreme hot temperatures are out there, our kids are in that river. And it's not just that Crow Agency, it's all the way up the river. In every community, the rivers are just a part of our life. And that photo there is taken at Crow Fair. You know, there's uh, maybe a thousand teepees there and maybe 20 or 30,000 people in that area and that river is just heavily used. And so for us to know the contaminants are in the river and we're not able to solve it yet is just, you know, it just drives that, that uh, desire to get it resolved and find an answer and a solution. Uh, the next photo here kind of shows another part of it. Um, uh, you, again, you see that uh, well there, and it's right next to a horse corral. And, um, you know, that well tested um, positive for coliform. We thought we was going to find E. coli in there, but we found coliform in there. And so um, the other day, Christine and myself were out there again. We took another sample, and uh, we didn't find coliform in there. So that's another question is, with all the new runoff and all of the contaminants that you would think that we showed up, why didn't they show up now at the high water time? But, so, something else for us to understand. Uh, these are some of our partners that we work with in different projects. Uh, Deborah Kyle, um, and that there is um, with the P50 group of the University of New Mexico. And uh, again, we're looking at the relationship between water contaminants and health issues from tribal members. And so a couple of years ago, we ran a health screening, and this summer I think there'll be another health screening. 
those people that have high levels of metals in their water, is it affecting their health? And if so, how? Is there a way to make those connections? Again, uh, this is a, a photo of our student interns and Christine. And uh, in this particular instance, it's a new uh, grant that we're looking for, and that's to try to look at arsenic in the Little Bighorn River. Why are we finding arsenic in the Little Bighorn River in such abundance that it can be a food source for a bacteria? And where's that arsenic coming from? In the background, you see a rail track there. Is it coming from the rail line? Is it coming naturally out of the hill drainages? And so that's another one that's a new, a new partnership that we're trying to um, develop. And this last photo here is uh, a group of uh, young students that we went up onto the Bighorn Mountains with. In the background is Bighorn Canyon, and Yellowtail Dam is right adjacent to that. But these are fifth graders out of the Crow Agency Public School, and I think there was from some from Wyola and Pryor and maybe Lodgegrass. And so Vanessa Simons runs that program, and that is teaching them fifth grade generation these are our scientists after Emory and Christine and Jory are doing something else, or maybe they're our age and say, you guys do it. And that's who we're hoping is gonna do it. And we know that we need to grow those scientists up. And so sometimes in our classrooms, they don't have time because of other curriculum needs. So uh, Jory, or um, Vanessa's program is an after school program. And so, uh, you know, it's, it, that's been a, great pleasure also and these are some of our collaborators here that we work with and uh, like I said the Crow tribe is our main um, collaborator Little Bighorn Co College if it wasn't there for us to be located at uh, we would be kind of no place to go so there's been a lot of partnerships that uh, come about because of this and we all have the same goal uh, let's make our communities and our waters safe and healthy and so with that I don't have anything else Oh, I want to introduce Dr. Camper. She's been with us for the past 10 years, and you know we've been very uh, grateful for her presence. And um, I think uh, I think she can talk a little bit. So I get the task of trying to wrap this all up, and this is going to be fairly difficult. I hope you've been impressed with some of the breadth and the depth of the research that's going on here, the number of people who've been involved. And as uh, was said at the very beginning of this presentation, this is community-based participatory research where the community has truly been involved in a driver of all the research that's taken place. It's been a partnership because obviously as a researcher, MSU researcher, I have questions that I want to answer. The community has questions and needs and you try and put those two things together and you come to a compromise on how you're going to collect the data and then how you're going to disseminate the results. I think one of the most rewarding things, though, is we've been saying this, and I'll say it again, is the ability to be able to engage some of the younger members of the community so that they are the next generation that carries forth some of the studies that have taken place here. And they're the ones who can take the data that we've been able to collect, translate it to the communities, and affect change. And that will, I hope, continue from not only this next generation, but generations to come. Personally, for me, this has been an incredibly rewarding opportunity as a researcher. I started as a bench scientist. So I did all the stuff at the, you know, wet science at the bench. I started life as a microbiologist, turned it in, into an engineer, and then be able to be, take some of those things that I've learned and translate that to something that can definitely solve problems on a community level has been an unbelievably enriching experience for me and then establishing some of the friendships that I've established over the years with a group of people that are here in this room and some who aren't with us right now have been involved with the project in the past. So you've seen a lot of projects outlined here and this isn't even all of it. So you can imagine the number of people, the funding resources that have been able to be obtained to provide resources for the projects, for the community, the translational work that's done on, the bench science work that's gone on, and then the total integration with the community and coming up with solutions that we hope are making a difference for people in the core reservation. And I sure hope that this project continues for a very, very long time and many others get to have the opportunity to have this, this experience that I've been able to experience. And, and they're all fabulous people and thank you so much for allowing me to be part of your team.
Okay. So, uh, you know, we want to uh, uh, give a gift to Ann. You know, I know she's you're going to make me cry. <laughs> she's been with us for 10 years, and uh, she's been so good for us. You know, it's made all the difference in our community and our steering committee. And so, uh, with that, um, Sarah and Mary, uh, we want to we want to give you this gift in appreciation and our showing our gratitude for your being there for us and our community. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Marty was my PhD student, so. <laughs> Thank you. You too. <laughs> Thank you all for coming today. We really appreciate your time and carry on. Oh, oh, oh. Does anyone have any questions for them? We want to give gifts to all of our wonderful presenters. So that's what we're doing now, but please stay, please stay, ask questions. There's also food out there that they're going to take away shortly, so please feel free to. I have a question. So did the depth of home wells um, have anything to do with the contamination you guys find, or does, does it matter? Um, so we noticed that there's some people's wells are um, drilled at different depths. Yeah. And so Emery was looking into that. And actually, to me, like I said earlier, to me it's just an assumption, but it's going to be a part of my analysis. After I run the analysis, I should have a clear picture, but making out, making an assumption, it, I feel like it does play a part. <coughs> the well depth, so shallower wells will have more contamination because you, know, you don't have the, the filter filterization through the ground is as a deeper well. Yeah. And part of that is the geology too. Yeah. yeah. So the water table has different layers as well. So just that plays a part. Any other questions? Yeah, and another one about um, climate change. Um, so what would you say to somebody that thinks that's just a cycle, you know, like the same thing happened to you 100 years ago and then it went back to normal. Well, is that what would you say to that, or do you think it's all because of uh, greenhouse emissions and such? I think that it's a human influence and it's human driven and it's being increased at a faster rate. So these changes are happening. Yeah, it is a cycle. It's going to go through these phases, but CO2 emissions are going to drive that change even faster. And so I think that's one of the main things that we're talking about is comparing these cycles versus human influence change. I think too when we talk about traditional eco ecological knowledge to UK, if, if this was a cycle that had happened before, it would have been part of our oral histories and people would have said, well, my grandmother said that her grandmother said this happened and this is, this is something that we should be expecting. And we don't hear those stories and so we're, we're we're thinking if we really um, see the value of, of traditional ecological knowledge, then it didn't happen the way you know, people want to assume that it did, at least in our area, and how it impacted our communities or our tribes. Well, there's refreshments out there. We want to thank all of you for coming, and we hope that you'll uh, take this information back and think about how you might use it to help other communities. See you at the power. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>